Okay, this panel is uh, picking out a few of the issues that we, uh, we saw as is extremely important for the future. Uh, first, cyber conflict, and that'll dovetail nicely with the, uh, the talk on software that we just heard. Uh, and then uh, lethal autonomy will continue to be, it's been in th pretty thoroughly researched, but there, there's more work to be done on it. It's certainly going to be a, a, uh, an operationally significant issue in the future. And then finally, territorial rights. There's a, a really interesting literature on this, uh, and uh, most military ethicists don't read it, aren't aware of it, and so I wanted to, to cover that too. Um, I apologize for packing this panel. There are just too many good issues and too many good people, and so I've told them, to, to go 15 minutes, and we probably will not have much Q&A time, and you can catch them on the breaks, uh, which are very short also, <laughs> and <laughs> for which I apologize. Next year, we'll have longer breaks. So uh, I'll just briefly, because everyone's in the program, introduce uh, the speakers in order. First is Dr. George Lucas. Welcome back, George. He's currently visiting Professor Notre Dame. He's president of ISME, and he's been at the Naval War College this year, and I think this is your last year there? Yes. Correct, okay. And secondly, Ryan Jenkins, uh, who's Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Senior Fellow at the Ethics and Emerging Sciences Group at Cal Poly. And then David, Dr. David Luban, who is University Professor of Law and Philosophy at Georgetown University Law Center. And he is the uh, Distinguished Visit Ethics Professor here at the uh, Stockdale Center. Ethics Chair, I'm sorry. And then finally, Dr. David Lefkowitz, who has been a uh, Fellow this year. He's Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Richmond. George. Thanks, Ed. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to be back here at the Naval Academy. Um, my, my fellow panelists include uh, an individual who's probably uh, one of the most distinguished international figures in ethics and international relations, uh, and two of the brightest young stars in the firmament, uh, young philosophers who are, are making a real impact. I want to hear what they have to say, so in my interest of that, I'm going to try and be really brief. Otherwise, I don't know what it says about my character that I don't have PowerPoints or even seek to fit in with the fellow panelists, uh, other than what's already known about my character, that I'm a an unpleasant, uh, dim-witted old grouch. Uh, and in that spirit, let me offer simply and briefly 12 crusty propositions about cyber warfare. Uh, utterly without evidence or argument, but since evidence and argument no longer play a role in public discourse, I feel I can dispense with that. Okay. First, Proposition 1. To those skeptics who think there really is no such thing as cyber warfare, that it's really a bunch of other stuff and a metaphorical use of the term, I say, I believe, there is such a thing as cyber war distinct from um, vandalism, from crime, from uh, hacktivism, that is political activism in the cyber domain by individuals or groups like Anonymous and, uh, and other organizations, or industrial or state espionage, that there is such a thing as cyber warfare distinct from all of those things. Proposition two, it comes in two forms. The first form, uh, exemplified by well-known events like Stuxnet, uh, and the recent um, mysterious uh, catastrophic destruction and failure of North Korean missiles. Uh, those are ki kinetic physical effects based weapons about which one of our panelists, uh, Ryan Jenkins, has written a good bit uh, and I'll defer to him on that. Uh, but that's one kind of warfare or weapon of warfare the one I'm interested in calling to your attention is the second less well understood uh, in my book uh, on the ethics of cyber warfare. I call it state-sponsored hacktivism. State-sponsored hacktivism, exemplified, of course, by familiar instances like the North Korean attack on Sony using uh, some rather sophisticated techniques and an otherwise amusing event that ended up uh, helping them uh, break into the SWIFT banking system and steal $81 billion from Bangladesh. Uh, the theft by the Kumtang uh, PLA unit of uh, 32 million, uh, sorry, uh, 22 million, I get the number wrong sometimes because I get upset my retirement documents were among the things that they stole, uh, which is why I'm still working. Uh, <laughs> so, try to get them back. OPM can't find my stuff. Um, 
the Russian DNC hack of the elections much discussed and so forth. Uh, France, what's going on uh, now in the elections there. And those state-sponsored hacktivism events are defined not by their physical effects, but by their political effects. <laughs> so they correspond to Randy Diepert's concern and uh, Brian Oren's fine definition of war. They are political. That's why I think they're also Clausewitz can be brought in here. They have political, they are political, uh, they have political ends. Uh, they are pursued by non-political means and they have great political effect. Um, both forms, this is my third proposition, both forms, especially state-sponsored hacktivism, are the chief tactics of soft war. So this ties in with the last panel. In fact, probably this talk might have gone before because they were trying to provide answers to questions that, uh, and I think some very, very telling and useful answers, as you'll see, to questions or problems that I'm going to raise in these propositions. So state-sponsored hacktivism and physical effects-based cyber weapons are both part of cyber warfare, uh, understood as soft war in terms of the last panel. The first known instance, this is uh, the fourth proposition, uh, historical footnote, first known instance was Estonia in 2007 in, with the benefit of hindsight. We could say more about that if we have time, about how it worked, how it didn't work, some of the egregious violations of some of the principles that Jessica and Valerie in particular were lifting up, uh, and lessons learned from that, which I spend some time uh, thinking about in my book. Number five, we, the USA, the UK, our allies, we are proficient in the first kind of cyber warfare. Not surprising, it takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, big bangs, big effects, uh, um, a, a lot of energy and industry. Adversary nations like China's PLA, North Korea, FSB in, in Russia, they are masters of the second type of cyber war. Proposition six, there is a distinct legal and moral regime that could be said to govern elements of the first type, uh, the physical effects base, the Talon manual in both forms, just war theory. Again, I think Ryan has had some things to say about this. Uh, does it matter that a weapon is made of software, TNT? Probably not, it's a weapon's a weapon, and therefore subject to the uh, convention on conventional weapons and various <laughs> other things. The seventh proposition is, however, state-sponsored hacktivism is not clearly governed by any of these. Not even Talon 2.0, that ham-handed, tone-deaf enterprise uh, that uh, has provided us with, a, over years of, of, of effort, a series of answers to questions nobody's raising. <laughs> Say more about that if you're interested. Uh, here, I think, is the troubling point, Proposition 8 of the 12. Our leadership, our experts do not distinguish and they do not understand the second type of cyber warfare. They have said so. I was just listening to General Mike Hayden two nights ago giving a brilliant and articulate and learned lecture on cyber war. And he came to this, you know, he cited some of these cases I've just cited, and he came to the North Korean attack on Sony, and he had a sentence, and he deliberately showed how he could not finish the sentence. I do not know what to call this. And he even told us stories of how long and how ineffectively it had taken the previous administration to come to terms with what was going on with the Russian interference in the election. Not surprising. We just don't have this in our category. We don't know what it is, we don't know how to respond, we don't know what to call it. We lump it together with things that are quite different, um, and I think it's a real problem for us. Ninth proposition, while anticipating for some years now, including twice at McCain conferences with some of the great experts like Richard Clark and others, uh, an apocalyptic, catastrophic, Pearl Harbor-like version of physical effects-based cyber warfare, this second kind, state-sponsored hacktivism, has snuck up on us from behind, taken advantage, confused, and uh, bewildered us. Uh, tenth proposition, we, and this is sort of follows from the ninth, we do not have 
a policy, a strategy, or an understanding of this second form of cyber warfare, unlike our fairly clear policy and strategy in the Department of Defense 2012 cyber strategy document, referring only to physical effects-based weapons in the end, once you make these distinctions. Our view was, if you take down our power grid, we will uh, send a nuclear missile down one of your smokestacks. That's a pretty clear policy. We don't have any similar kind of reaction for what the Russians did in the election uh, or what the North Koreans did to Sony. Okay, 11th proposition, I'm nearly done. Uh, the first kind of cyber warfare is very limited in its access. Very few nations have the capacity to develop effective physical effects-based cyber weapons. And there are a lot of disadvantages in spending a lot of time trying because once you use them, they're no good anymore. Um, the second, however, state-sponsored hacktivism is readily available for mastery by less well-resourced states for clever and effective use. Which brings me to my 12th and concluding remark. State-sponsored hacktivism, the second form of cyber warfare involves cheap, effective warfare tactics and weapons easily available to our adversaries used effectively by them to date with great effect and advantage. They are, as I say, eating our lunch in this second area. These are ungoverned at present by law and morality, though the previous panelists pointed ways that we could bring them under the auspices of, of uh, some form uh, or rubric of reasonable constraint. We don't understand this. We don't even know what to call it. Uh, and I think that's why what <laughs> Michael, Valerie, and the folks working on their project is, are, are doing is so important. The resources lie in the questions and the issues they're debating. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can get up. Get up. All right, thanks. So uh, Winston Churchill's been quoted a couple times already in this conference. I figure what's one more quote? Um, Thank you. I sympathize with one of his Good. laments, which is, I think, newly relevant again, that a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on. And I often feel that way as someone that studies the ethics of emerging technologies, that new technologies can get halfway around the world before we moral philosophers have a chance to put our pants on. Even though we've been putting our pants on for 2,300 years or so, uh, the problem is that new technologies continue to raise questions that are still some of the most fiercely debated and some of the most intractable uh, puzzles in the history of philosophy. And in my talk today, I hope to illuminate what some of those disagreements precisely are. So I study the ethics of autonomous systems pretty broadly. That includes things like autonomous weapons. It also includes autonomous vehicles. It also includes artificial intelligence and algorithms and big data. And something that has been uh, provoking me to think more deeply about autonomous weapons is the distinction that people often draw between autonomous weapons and autom autonomous vehicles. So for example, we see among the public a widespread enthusiasm and an eagerness that awaits the arrival of autonomous vehicles. Right? Mm -hmm. There are some of us that can't wait to get into one. While at the same time we see a widespread repugnance or horror or at least a kind of fear and unease at the prospect of autonomous weapons. And it's not exactly clear to me if there's a principled moral distinction that underlies this conflict or this tension in our intuition. So today I want to talk about some of the potential differences, some of the similarities and differences between the debates over these two technologies. So we know that lots of pressures, some of the pressures that we've been hearing about yesterday and today in the battle space are going to uh, lead to increased autonomy. Things like increased complexity, the tempo of battle, the need to operate in denied environments, and the recognition of these trends is driving some of the aspects of the third offset strategy, like um, an emphasis on AI, big data, and robot and machine teaming or collaboration. The idea that decisions need to be increasingly offloaded from humans to machines. So what happens, for example, if we continue to leave 
human beings in the loop, in the decision-making loop with machines or alongside machines. Well, some of, them, some of the problems that we might be worried about we might call empirical mistakes. These are mistakes that machines make in discerning the facts of the matter. So we might think, for example, uh, take something like the principle of distinction or the principle of discrimination. We might think that the world <coughs> comes neatly carved up into categories like combatant and non-combatant or legitimate and illegitimate target. But some people have pointed out that that's not so clear. So for example, we can teach a machine to recognize faces or to recognize human emotions very well. But the question of whether someone's a legitimate combatant isn't answered by determining, say, whether they're wearing a uniform. Because there are other things that we need to look at. Things like whether they could be surrendering or whether they're meaningfully contributing to ongoing hostilities. This is the kind of language that we find in international law. And it generates problems or at least generates, I think, some legitimate skepticism about the ability of machines, including autonomous weapons, to make discernments like this. Because the kinds of decisions that they'll have to make are decisions about, say, causal structures or human intentions. And this is not as easy as determining whether someone's wearing a uniform or whether they're carrying a rocket-propelled grenade or a camera. We also see uh, issues of what we can call overtrust. So in cases where humans and machines work together, cases where humans and machines collaborate, we see issues where humans start to place too much trust in machines. I think uh, probably a lot of us have done this when we've trusted Word to correct our spelling or our grammar. Uh, <laughs> even though we can't explain why, we say, the machine probably knows better than we do about this. Uh, we saw this in the Tesla crash that took place when someone's Tesla was on autopilot. They basically set it on autopilot, and as far as we can tell, uh, they were watching a Harry Potter movie when their Tesla slammed into a semi that was crossing the road uh, across them because they trusted that their car would break or something like that. We also see it in the early days of uh, the Iraq War, the 2003 invasion of Iraq, where there was a, a mistake where a Patriot missile system shot down um, a British fighter in a friendly fire incident, and overtrust was partly blamed for that, that the Patriot missile made a mistake in identifying uh, the British fighter and the humans that were in charge of the Patriot missile system trusted the machine. They placed too much trust, as it were, to make that decision for them. These worries are compounded by what we might call the black box problem, which is that autonomous systems and uh, systems that learn by machine learning or learn on data can become black boxes. And it, it becomes very difficult for us to tell exactly how they've made the decisions that they have. So we see, for example, problematic trends, lots of biases that are being exhibited by uh, artificially intelligent systems or machine learning systems. Uh, you might have heard about some of these in the news, things that are determining, say, uh, programs that are determining prison sentences or uh, someone's fitness for a bank loan or uh, filtering out applications for a job or something like that. We see over and over again machines that take in quote unquote objective data and then spit out results that we can show are systematically biased in one way or another and the mystery becomes to explain exactly why that is. We should be worried, I think, about deploying systems like this, systems that make systematic errors and do it in a way that's opaque. We should be worried about deploying systems like this and delegating the task of killing human beings to systems like this. So we know, for example, that AI systems and machine learning can be flawed. We also know that they can be fooled rather easily. So for example, there are systems that uh, are trained to distinguish a stop sign from a yield sign. It's a task that any human could do without thinking about it very much. And tasks that computers can be trained to do very, very well. Only we can see that they can be manipulated fairly easily by changing just a handful of pixels in a picture of a stop sign to make the computer then think that it's a yield sign. The problem is that computers lack what we might call, for lack of a better term, uh, something like common sense that all human beings have. And this opens the door to them being manipulated or being exploited by adversaries potentially. You can imagine, for example, an adversary manipulating their own insignia in a way that's indistinguishable to a human being, but would then cause a computer or a machine vision program to read that as a different kind of insignia or a different kind of emblem. So, as the tempo, of, the tempo of battle increases and puts pressure on even greater offloading of decisions to machines, we'll probably start to see more decisions that are on the loop rather than in the loop. So human-based systems where humans have some oversight of the decisions that are taking place, but where they themselves are not uh, offering any decisions or any input. And we might also see 
that as the tempo of battle increases, as we heard yesterday from General Silva, that uh, these decisions have to be made so quickly in some cases that arrangements that are on the loop may practically become out of the loop decisions where humans are almost entirely impotent to change the decisions that uh, computers are making. Now, we can ask questions here about how machines and humans interact. There are lots of interesting psychological questions. I want to put those to the side for the time being and focus instead on the moral questions. Moral <coughs> questions about what happens when it is a machine, say an autonomous weapon, making a lethal decision all on its own. And there's been quite a lot of ink spilled in the moral philosophy literature about this, but as I asked uh, the general yesterday morning or the vice chairman yesterday morning, these feelings remain fairly nebulous and it's very difficult. It's been very difficult over the last decade or so while these conversations have been taking place to put a fine point on exactly what the problem is with delegating the task of killing to a machine. So you might think that there's uh, a kind of problem with responsibility or accountability. If a machine is making a decision, and if a machine makes the wrong decision, say something that would be a war crime if it were committed by a human being, whom can we hold accountable for this? Whom can we justly punish for this kind of decision? Surely it's outlandish to suggest that we punish the machine itself. What would that even look like? It doesn't make sense to suggest that we punish uh, the creators of the machine or the manufacturers. If the machine is autonomous, if the machine is making its own decisions and it's behaving unpredictably, after all, this is just what it means for it to be autonomous, then it also seems unjust to punish the manufacturers for delivering the kind of product that they were supposed to deliver. And we can run a similar kind of argument for why it's unjust to hold any particular human being responsible. Now, if we go to war without the ability to hold our soldiers responsible, you might think that we've crossed the kind of line that separates civilized armies from barbarians, that we have effectively uh, renounced any kind of obligation or any kind of allegiance to international law and accountability. Some people think this is profoundly disrespectful. And for this reason, a lot of people are calling for uh, keeping meaningful human control over these weapons. There are, of course, further philosophical questions about what it means to be meaningful. I think uh, Dr. Louvain is going to talk about this a little bit, talk about what exactly the important kinds of control are to retain over autonomous systems. Um, but if we imagine that we solve these kinds of problems, suppose that autonomous systems are nearly perfect, suppose they're at least as good or better than a human soldier would be, now we start to raise some of the really interesting fundamental moral questions about the use of weapons in war and the purpose of war, what we think it means to make war good or bad or to make war better. So for example, several people have worried that autonomous weapons would be mala in se, that they would be evil in themselves and therefore forbidden by the just war convention or the just war tradition uh, for some of the same reasons that indiscriminate weapons are forbidden. So the philosopher Thomas Nagel, for example, said that what distinguishes war from massacre is that act actions in war, legitimate actions of killing in war, are directed at people rather than situations. And they're directed at individuals for whom we can justify this act of violence by pointing to something that that particular person has done to make themselves liable to be killed. This is the difference between directing an act of violence at an individual or directing it at a situation. And some people might object to autonomous weapons because when they are unleashed, as it were, they are directed at no particular person. And you might think that this makes them disrespectful or problematic for the same reason that indiscriminate killing is problematic. However, when it comes right down to it, it's very difficult when we dig into this claim too to pinpoint exactly what could be problematic with this. <coughs> So for example, we find that it's very, very difficult to distinguish between autonomous weapons and the way that they target and the way that they execute their commands and other weapons that are widely used and widely accepted in warfare. So things like cruise missiles or long range artillery. It would be uh, outlandish or incredible to suggest, for example, that we know the identities of each individual person that's killed by these kinds of weapons and yet we don't think that they're objectionable for that reason. And so it remains an open question if there is a significant moral difference between weapons that have been used for decades and are widely accepted and new weapons like autonomous weapons. And I'm happy to talk about that distinction and how we dig into that more in the Q&A or in the break if you'd like. At this point, people that are worried, people that express anxiety or trepidation about autonomous weapons will come back and they'll say, well, no, there's something different here. 
they're genuinely autonomous. They have the kind of agency that a human being has, and for that reason, they're an original source of actions. They're their own uh, genesis of actions, and they have a kind of free will. But as you can imagine, this is one of the oldest questions in philosophy. It remains a very tangled and thorny and controversial question about what exactly it means to have free will, and if these machines could have free will in the way that human agents could too. So now you start to see where we're getting to the moral bedrock. We're answering these larger questions, answering the more specific questions about the permissibility of autonomous weapons can't be done satisfactorily without answering more <laughs> fundamental questions that have exercised philosophers for decades or millennia. If we suppose that all of these issues are solved, if we suppose that autonomous weapons become as accurate or more accurate, more reliable than human soldiers, we're forced to confront some of the deepest questions about the morality of warfare. Namely, can we make warfare more humane by eliminating the human being from the element or eliminating the human element from the equation entirely? Or is there something sort of perverse about this? Could it be possible to make war more humane by delegating killing entirely to unfeeling machines? This is where the debate stands, I think, and this is really the crux of the disagreement about autonomous weapons. And this is the position that people are in. And neither side has a fully comfortable position here. For example, if you want to retain the humanity, for those of, uh, those of us uh, that think that there is something perhaps really deeply problematic, like the general yesterday, the vice chairman yesterday was saying, something that's really deeply problematic, even if that remains a kind of nebulous aversion or intuition that autonomous weapons are problematic, those people are left in the position of insisting that it would be better for us to wage war with human soldiers even if we know that they are less reliable, and even if we know that it will lead to avoidable civilian casualties. And while that might be a broadly, intuitively uh, appealing proposition to ban autonomous weapons, it leaves us in a very uncomfortable position otherwise with what it says about our feelings about war. So those are the kinds of questions that we have to confront about what it means to be humane, what it means to make war a civilized endeavor. Thanks. Hello. Uh, I, first of all, I'm going to have to begin with uh, uh, an apology. I have a class to teach at 120 back at Georgetown, so I am not going to be able to hang around to talk with you after this panel. But uh, um, if anybody wants to follow up on anything in the, the panel, uh, please feel free to just contact me. Uh, so yesterday when uh, General Selva was talking about uh, autonomous weapons and how it's inevitable, that our adversaries will all get them, I suddenly had this, this vision of a great work of literature which is going to be called the Iliad 2.0. <laughs> uh, in the Iliad 2.0, uh, their robots and our robots, the Greek robots and the Trojan robots, are going to meet on the plain of Ilium and fight it out, and we are the Greek gods. Uh, the Greek god, and because we're just watching the spectacle, right. the Greek gods have ambrosia and nectar, we have beer and guacamole. Uh, so, you can also rename it Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm down with it. 3.0. Uh, now, this raises the question about how person like are these objects? And uh, I want to address today and express some skepticism about. Uh, the most audacious claim that I think that uh, autonomous weapons systems advocates make, and that is uh, the one that Ryan was talking about at the end of uh, his, uh, uh, his very fine you know, overview of this subject, uh, which is, uh, uh, what if they can be more ethical than we can? What if they can fight more humanely than we can? Aren't we then under a moral permission or maybe even a moral obligation uh, to use them, and let me just start by trying to express that argument uh, in what I think is the strongest form. Uh, I'll, just to make sure that we're all talking about something on the same page, the kind of autonomous, autonomous weapon systems that I'm thinking about are uh, uh, a subset of anything that we, everything that we might think of as autonomous. It's the ones that have these characteristics. Uh, they are unmanned mobile robots they have lethal capacity. They're deployed in combat operations, in armed conflict. 
They autonomously choose their own targets using artificial intelligence, and uh, the artificial intelligence programs are self-learning in the sense that uh, um, they can uh, get better and better at the tasks that the programmers assign them. So, uh, uh, you know, call them terminators. These are, these are terminators. Um, now, the important claim that the advocates make is that it's possible to build ethics software, and it's currently being developed, uh, that uh, gets built into autonomous weapon systems. So the sixth feature of the weapons that I'm talking about uh, are that uh, they fight ethically in the sense that they have constraints programmed into them uh, to honor the use in bello and to uh, honor the law of armed conflict. So we can call them ethical terminators, ETs if you want. <laughs> now, we don't have any ETs today, uh, but the claim that the advocates make is that they are just around the corner um, temporally, technologically, with uh, rapid improvements uh, in maneuvering, um, in facial recognition, in emotional recognition, in uh, identification. Uh, artificial intelligence is overtaking human actors. So just in the way that Deep Blue beats Garry Kasparov at chess, um, and Watson beats the world Jeopardy champion at Jeopardy, and AlphaGo beats <coughs> one of the world's greatest Go masters at Go, uh, the thought is that soon we have uh, an artificial intelligence program, uh, call it Socrates, that will uh, become the new ethics bowl champion of the world. Um, now, there's one important criticism that a number of writers have made, which is that these things don't have moral judgment. They don't have moral compass. They don't make their decisions for the right reasons, um, the, the reasons that human beings uh, who, as moral agents would make them. Um, uh, now, suppose that's right. I think that's debatable. But uh, I think that the advocate would say that it's answering the wrong question. It's not whether they have the right kind of moral compass, the right moral reasons. It's whether they get to the right outcomes. And you know, this is something that you can even take from Kant, you know, who insisted that acting for the right reason is the hallmark of a moral agent, but that uh, in the realm of public right, it's the behavior that counts, not whether it's being done for the moral motivation. And so what we want to know is, can they do better than human beings? And what I want to insist, uh, when I'm setting out the argument of advocates, is that beating human beings at getting the right outcomes is the name of the game. And here I want to invoke something that I'm going to call the hungry grizzly principle. And it's based on this old joke that uh, um, if you're camping, and a hungry grizzly bear charges into the camp looking for some juicy person to eat, you don't have to outrun the grizzly. You just have to outrun the other campers. Um, so uh, for all the reasons that Ryan mentioned, we can have skepticism that ETs are going to get a lot of stuff right. They don't have to get it right in the champagne quality or gold medal quality. Well, gold medal, actually, you do have to get. They have to beat the other campers. They have to beat the human agents. Now, let's make this concrete by talking about one particular use in Bello principle, and that is uh, the principle of distinction. Um, isn't it possible that we could program an ET so that it's better at distinguishing combatants from non-combatants? Ryan explained why this is a very hard task, but once again, think of the hungry grizzly principle. It's not whether ET gets it right all of the time. It's whether ET gets it right at least as often or more often than a Marine or a soldier who is in similar conditions. And that's a tough task. Marines and soldiers have a hard time on it. So this is a problem of self-learning. Uh, and we could imagine putting uh, you know, a, a simulated urban combat environment of going house to house and clearing houses at night, uh, put in human marines and soldiers in it um, you know, over here, over here put in ET, and every time ET gets it right, we record that it gets it right, every time ET gets it wrong, and then in the familiar way that uh, machines learn, test, operate, test, operate, test, get it right, exit, the tote cycle, uh, we train them up so that they score at least as well, or maybe better, 
than our Marine and our soldier. And at that point, we've got the right outcomes. Now, uh, don't think that it can never happen. Ask the World Jeopardy champion if you think that it could never happen. Uh, now, here's the part of the argument that um, uh, officers, I think, hate to or hate to hear, but that the advocates for autonomous weapon systems uh, uh, insist on, and that is that human beings aren't so good at this. They aren't so good at making ethical decisions. Um, it's not just that uh, they are sleep deprived, that they may be stressed out, they may be angry, they may be vengeful, they may want payback for their wounded or killed comrades. Um, and if it comes to a call between protecting teammates or sparing innocent civilians, uh, they're very likely to decide that the teammate comes first no matter what the use in Bella or the law of armed conflict says in that situation. And not only that, uh, Ronald Arkin, who's one of these proponents, uh, likes to cite a 2006 Surgeon General's report that surveys or uniform military and discovers disturbing levels of saying, you know, we don't actually think that the enemy civilians deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. And a significant number saying, no, I wouldn't report a teammate, you know, who has uh, done something that's a violation of the law of armed conflict. So what Arkin insists is we aren't so hot at this. We aren't so hot at this. Now, how about ET? Well, ET never gets angry. ET never gets vengeful. E.T. never gets sleepy, never gets tempted to loot, or God forbid to rape, doesn't let loyalty to fellow E.T.'s uh, uh, get in the way of moral decision making, has faster reaction time, so the kind of mistakes that a human being makes because there's only a tenth of a second to decide if this person coming through the door is friendly or not, uh, E.T. can do it quicker. Um, E.T. doesn't cover up mistakes. Uh, that have cost civilian lives, and it may have better sensory abilities than the human counterparts. So in a very real way, it may be that ET is eventually going to lead to more humanitarian outcomes and better operational success. Now that's the, that's the pro-autonomous -autonom weapons systems argument that I want to counter. And, uh, uh, I'm going to, next to the hungry grizzly principle, put another principle, G-I-G-O, GIGO. Um, I don't know whether this is still used. When I took my one and only computer course, which was back in, uh, back when we still beat laundry against stones to clean it. Uh, uh, actually, we didn't have stones back then. We used our heads. Uh, the computers were uh, half the size of this room, and we were doing punch cards, and the very first thing that the teacher said was garbage in, garbage out, G-I-G-O. That the outcome that the machine gets will never, ever be any better than the input that the humans put into it. And the thesis that I'm going to defend today is a generalization of that, uh, and that is that in the real world, autonomous weapon systems will never be much better than the human beings who use them because people pick the garbage that goes in. Uh, and so that's the debate, the hungry grizzly principle versus G-I-G-O. Uh, now, um, I want to start this argument with um, what I think is a, a really important methodological principle. Now, I know most people, I mean, normal human beings, when they hear the, met the word methodology, they immediately begin to kind of nod out, except for political scientists, and that's the only time they ever perk up. <laughs> uh, so the methodological principle is this. When we're thinking about any weapon system, including autonomous weapon systems, we can't think of them in isolation from the practical settings that they'll be used, which I'm going to call uh, the military, industrial, and sometimes legal ecosystem that they belong to. So put it in other words, let's not imagine the ideal ter ethical terminator. Let's imagine terminators that are purchased through the procurement program of the real Pentagon and deployed by real human commanders. So let's start up in the Pentagon. Somebody is drawing up specs and putting the contracts out to bid. They are not necessarily looking for the best ethics software that money can buy. First of all, they don't want ethics software that is so conscientious that it interferes with military success. 
A super conscientious uh, ET uh, might be more concerned with the false positives, that is, mistaking civilians for combatants, <coughs> than with the false negatives, mistaking combatants for civilians. Uh, and that is, it may decide that erring on the side of precaution is more important than erring on the side of killing enemies. And it may very well be that whoever is writing the specifications for this doesn't want such a ratio of false positives to false negatives. Now, let's suppose that we bring uh, some lawyers in. And the lawyers are going to get really nervous because all of the terms in the law of armed conflict that have to do with taking precautions to avoid civilian casualties are squishy terms. Lawyers like squishy terms, vague terms, because it gives a lot of wiggle room. And they might be saying, now look, don't make this thing too conscientious because that will set a dangerous precedent and it might lead to accountability that we don't want and it might push the law of armed conflict in a way that our legal department doesn't want to see it pushed. So don't make it too much better than the human being. Make it as close to what the human being does as you possibly can because that gives us more legal wiggle room and that gets built into the specifications as well. Uh, now, the procurement officer may well tell the contractor, uh, okay, take that into account. Um, now, that's one concrete way in which our ethical terminator will not be any better than the human beings who purchase uh, and use them. Now, for that matter, are we sure that the procurement officers will care more about how good the ethical software is at ethics rather than caring about how fast it can be brought online, how much it costs, what its repair record is, how easy it is to use in the field? I'm inclined to doubt that. And how about the contractor who is building it? Um, they may know how to build uh, uh, absolutely first-rate ethics software, but maybe in order to meet their deadlines or to meet their budget, uh, they're you know, going to say, let's cut some corners here, let's cut some corners there. We need to sacrifice some ethics acumen in order to get interoperability with uh, the military success part of it. Uh, so we should assume that, the, that ET doesn't necessarily have ethics software that is much better than what the people who design, build, and order it uh, want it to have. Now let's move down the road to when it's deployed. And I'm going to suppose not that it's working in the best possible way, but we're going to, I'm going to assume that uh, um, the worst happens. First, we send uh, our ETs uh, into a town to clear the town and afterwards, the human beings come in, and it turns out that ET hasn't killed enough of the enemy, and that we're taking casualties. Um, and let's suppose something even worse. Suppose that the commander decides we're actually losing this fight. Um, now, isn't this frustrated commander, as I'm going to call him, likely to say, turn that damn thing off? Turn off the ethics software. It is costing us in military effectiveness. Now, of course, we can build it so the commander can't turn it off, but then Specialist Davis raises her hand and she says, sir, I know how to hack. Uh, just give me a laptop and a few minutes to download a few tools from the dark internet, and I will disable ET and also ET's reporting device that says that it's been disabled. Now, of course, an ethical commander won't go there, uh, but I'm talking about a frustrated commander who is taking casualties in which the battle outcome is not going the way that he wants it, he's going to be sorely tested. And once again, our ethical terminator is not going to be any better than the human beings who deploy it. Now, for that matter, it may be very easy for the frustrated commander to gain ET. ET is going to, it's going to be a use and bellow uh, ethicist. It's going to have to make proportionality calculations. It may be very good better than a human being at estimating one side of those calculations, how many anticipated civilian dead. We could even build in a real estate appraiser uh, function so that it can uh, put a dollar price on what the, uh, you know, what the property damage is that it's inflicting. <laughs> on the other side, what's the military advantage? And how do we know what excessive means? Uh, the military advantage is going to have to be inputted, input, whatever the, uh, that, that was input by a human being. 
It's going to be figured out by a human being and input by a human being. And our frustrated commander may simply uh, operate uh, or estimate military advantage at the high end in order to make the proportionality calculation come out in a way that's more um, salubrious for military success. Um, or maybe programming in, and presumably you have to be able to program in any set of ROEs that comes down the pike, program in a more forgiving set of ROEs. Uh, now, how about the third principle, military necessity, that is going to be even more hostage to what human beings input. Um, and human inputs can be gamed. Uh, so what I want to say is that at every step of the way, from the moment that this thing is procured to the moment that it's deployed to the kind of inputs that commanders give to it, um, it is not going to be better than the, than the human beings who are inputting. Um, if we put in moral garbage, we're going to get moral garbage out. Now, in my story, I've probably even left out a few levels that I haven't thought of. Um, now, that means that, um, just to return to my earlier metaphor, this machine <coughs> can't outrun the hungry grizzly because your fellow camper, the human being who's inputted, is handcuffed to you, the autonomous weapon system. In the end, um, I want to uh, go back to the Greeks. Protagoras uh, was famous for saying man is the measure of all things and then added uh, of that which is that it is, of that which is not that it is not. Now I think that it, when it comes to science, um, I disagree with Protagoras. Man isn't the measure of all things. When it comes to religion, man isn't the measure of all things. We can argue about in morality whether man is the measure of all things. But I'm convinced that in autonomous weapons systems, man is, still remains the measure of all things, of that which is autonomous, that it is autonomous, and of that which, it is, which is not autonomous, that it is not autonomous. So, thank you. So I, I'm a, a, a double disadvantage here. Uh, first of all, I have to follow David. Uh, and uh, secondly, um, I kind of feel like my first slide should have been that great quote from Monty Python, now for something completely different. Uh, all the presentations on this panel, many of the other presentations uh, today, and some of the discussion yesterday focus on new technologies, the ethical questions that are raised by those technologies, or maybe changing demographics, changing uh, climate, and so on. Um, I'm going to come at this from the opposite end, so I want to talk with you a little bit about some new work in political philosophy and try to identify what implications it may have for our um, engaging in armed conflict, uh, given more or less the facts um, as they are and the technologies, demographics as they are. Uh, okay, so over the last uh, decade or so, political philosophers have become uh, deeply engaged with questions concerning states territorial rights. Uh, so we're all familiar, I think, with states' territorial rights as a matter of international law. Uh, philosophers have begun to look at this uh, more carefully from uh, a moral standpoint. Uh, and some of the uh, questions that we're concerned with, I think, are uh, questions of longstanding interest. So um, these are not totally new questions. Uh, in particular, questions concerning uh, political self-determination. So um, what groups um, ought to exercise political control over a particular territory? Uh, and why is that? Why nations? Why any people that's able to organize itself for political ends and so on? Uh, certainly we're familiar with questions of legitimacy. Um, how must political power over a territory be exercised so that those who exercise it do so rightly? That is to say, uh, in a manner that entitles them to exercise um, that control over territory. But one question that we haven't really talked that much about is this third one here, a theory of attachment to territory. So, what is it that justifies a state's claim to rule some particular territory? The mere fact that a government exercises, uh, that a, a, a state governs well, say, doesn't seem uh, to be the sort of thing that suffices to entitle it to control a particular territory. 
uh, if the United States, maybe we should do this reverse, uh, but if the United States were to uh, extend its control over uh, Canada and to exercise government over that territory in a manner that was superior to the way Canada's government had exercised control over that territory, we might still think that that was not sufficient to justify the United States control over that territory. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we might think that a particular group is entitled to political self-determination. We might think that it ought to have its own state. Um, but whatever argument uh, leads us to that conclusion will not suffice by itself to tell us what the boundaries of the state ought to be, where it ought to exercise uh, political self-determination. So a comprehensive account of a state's moral right to rule some particular territory has to give us an account of attachment to that particular territory. Uh, philosophers who have been thinking about this over the past decade are uh, pretty much unanimous in agreeing that the state's claim to rule a particular territory is mediated by the rights of its subjects <coughs> to occupy that territory. Right? So that's kind of a common starting point. Uh, but then uh, philosophers disagree about um, who is the actor that has the right to occupy a territory and what exactly explains why that actor has a right to occupy that territory. So, uh, for example, uh, Professor Anna Stills um, uh, from Princeton University um, has developed what I would describe as an individualist account of occupancy rights. You can see here what occupancy rights uh, consist in. Uh, they have some of the feel of a property right, but she emphasizes that they are not the same thing as a natural property right. They have some of the feel of a state's jurisdictional claims, but again, she emphasizes that they are not the same as a jurisdictional claim. Another question to consider is, um, what justifies these individual occupancy rights? So we've characterized what the right is, but then we want to know why we should concede that uh, people have occupancy rights so characterized. Professor Still's answer is that um, occupancy in a territory is uh, essential to the um, um, ability to form and act on a conception of the good. Right? So for almost all people, um, developing some conception of the good, some uh, projects and relationships, uh, and then pursuing that conception of the good is going to be territorially uh, grounded. And I think the easiest way to kind of get a sense for what's going on here is to think about what happens to people who are forcibly displaced from whatever territory they may have built their life in. Right? For the vast majority of human beings, that's going to be uh, terribly disruptive to their pursuit of uh, whatever life plans it is that they've formed. So we have on the one hand Still's individualist account. We have uh, uh, on the other a uh, nationalist account. So David Miller is uh, one of the uh, political philosophers who is uh, an advocate of this view. Um, here the occupancy is not in, uh, done by the individual, but instead <coughs> by a group, in particular uh, a nation. Miller uh, defends it by what goes under the heading of a quasi Lockean account of how nations come to have occupancy rights in territories, how particular territories come to belong in this sense uh, to nations. Uh, and that's through the nations transforming the territory, describes two different ways in which they can do that. Um, one is through material transformation, so you can see a few examples here. Um, the other way is through symbolic uh, transformations, um, certainly important uh, spiritual events, important events uh, in the history of the nation. Um, and again, I think Miller here is kind of tracking something in the same way that stills us, something that is uh, intuitively familiar to us, um, the idea of a national homeland. Okay, so we have two different counts of occupancy rights. Uh, sadly, an all too familiar phenomenon in human history is the forcible displacement of people from the territories where they have built their lives or the territories of uh, national homelands. And so we need to develop uh, a right of return, a theory of the conditions under which people retain their rights of occupancy in a territory or the conditions under which they lose those rights. So um, stills, first of all, the easiest claim here, if you have an occupancy right in territory T and you are wrongly displaced from it, well, you retain a right of return to that territory. Right? Might does not make right, at least not quite th that quickly on uh, Still's account. However, <coughs> if you are the descendant of someone who was wrongly displaced from a territory, and you yourself never lived in that territory, never developed a conception of the good life that was grounded in that territory, then on Still's account, you have no right of return to that territory. 
Remember that for stills, the point of the right of occupancy is to protect your ability to lead your life, which you have built in that place. If you have not built your life in that place, then you've got no right to return to it. You do have a right on her account to stable citizenship somewhere so that you can build a territorially grounded conception of the good and pursue it, but right, it doesn't have to be in the territory from which your forebears were expelled. Also, if you are the descendant of some of the people who wrongly invaded and displaced people from Territory T, you're just born in that territory, right, and you grow up in that territory, you develop a conception of the good that is territorially grounded there, then on Still's account, you have a right to remain there. You have a right to occupy that territory. Just to, uh, I won't be able to go into this in any detail, um, that's not a claim about who's going to get to rule that territory. So it may be that descendants will have a right to remain in the territory is not yet, right, more argument would be necessary, a claim to show that the state that currently governs that territory is going to be entitled to continue to do so. All right, so Miller, on the other hand, right, focusing on nations rather than individuals, the most important implication here that distinguishes um, his account from Stills is that since the right of return belongs to the nation, it's going to extend to members of the nation who never themselves lived in that territory. So for Stills descendants, generation one, generation two, they don't have a, a right of return, but for Miller, they almost surely will. Uh, now, that right of return remains as long as some of the material value that the nation created in that territory um, continues to um, exist in that territory. Likewise, as long as it remains integral to the identity of the nation, to the history of the nation. Um, but it weakens as that nation, A, adds value, both material and symbolic, in whatever place it now resides. And B, whenever a nation now occupies territory T, as it adds value, as it transforms the, value, uh, the territory, both materially and symbolically, its claim uh, to that territory increases. Now one implication of this is that there's going to be some period of time during which two nations, or possibly more than two nations, will have strong claims to uh, reside in, for their members to reside in the same territory. And in principle, that might be worked out, but it's likely to put pressure on those two other features of a theory of states' territorial rights I mentioned earlier, and that is national self-determination on the one hand, right? So nations may have to compromise in their ability to pursue self-determination in their own state. It also might threaten legitimacy, right, the legitimacy of the government insofar as one nation uses the instruments of the state to oppress the other nations in that territory. All right. What are some of the implications of these theories of territorial rights, moral theories of territorial rights for just cause for war? Well, here's the first one. If you think that occupancy rights are kind of like property rights, and if you think that property rights do not provide just cause for the use of force, at least in those cases where retreat is possible, well then it may not be permissible, right? at least you might not have a just cause for war if it's possible for you to retreat. So if it's possible for you to sacrifice a portion of the territory of your state, the nation, those members of the nation that live in that territory can retreat to the remainder state, right? They can remain part of the nation. The nation will still have its own state. It may still rule um, legitimately. Well, then it's not clear you're going to be justified in fighting a war solely for the sake of protecting occupancy in a territory. On the other hand, still says, well, look, if you think you can use defensive force in order to prevent an injury like the loss of an arm, for example, well, the effects of being driven from the territory where you have um, built your life uh, may be, arguably are, uh, similar, perhaps even greater, to the loss that you suffer if you were to uh, lose an arm. And so, in fact, defensive force may be justified right, solely for the purpose of protecting occupancy of the territory. No need for retreat. And we might also wonder about our intuitions that property um, is not the sort of loss that can warrant um, the use of defensive force. Those intuitions may follow only if we assume a certain kind of background institutional structure in which we make that judgment. If that structure is absent, as arguably it is in international affairs, well, then we may draw different intuitions. This is actually the question that 
I'm most interested in. Wars of return. Is return of people to a territory from which they were wrongly displaced a just cause for war? First thing to note, if a state's right to rule a territory is mediated by its subjects' rights to occupy that territory, then only if it's permissible to fight a war to return those people to the territory they have a right to occupy will a state be justified in trying to use force to reassert control over that territory. Hmm. So any state that has lost its territory, if its people have been also expelled from that territory, this condition is going to have to hold in order for that state to be justified, speaking morally here, to go to war to reclaim that territory. For how long will a right of return provide a just cause for war? We saw in Still's case, we're talking maximally one generation here, right? Once the people, um, once there's no one who ever had a right to occupy that territory alive, no longer provides a just cause for war. But on Miller's account, right, nations are going to re retain a right of return to a territory for at least several generations. So do we have now a just cause for war that persists for several generations? I mean, we know as a factual matter that there are certainly many groups historically that have maintained that that is so. But the question is whether they are uh, correct to do so. If we think that a right of return provides a just cause for war, does massive forcible internal displacement provide a just cause for humanitarian intervention? We don't have to um, be talking about, say, systematic violations of the most basic human rights, people's rights. Those rights may be sustained, and yet large populations may be displaced. Again, there are plenty of examples from uh, history. And finally, if we draw an asymmetric conclusion, so if we say it's permissible for you to use force in order to resist those who would wrongly drive you from a territory, uh, but we don't think it's permissible to use force in order to return to that territory where you have a right of occupancy, what might explain? And does it depend on the quality of the life you have wherever you're living now? So maybe we think if you're stuck uh, in a refugee camp, then perhaps you've got a just cause to use force to return to the territory that you have a right to occupy. On the other hand, if you've been settled in a liberal democracy and been granted citizenship in that state, uh, perhaps at this point, though you retain a right of return, because of the conditions under which you live now, you are not entitled to use force in order to give effect uh, to that right. I just want to finish with uh, a couple of comments. So everything I've been saying till this uh, point uh, is relatively abstract moral theory. It's not even complete moral theory because all I focused on is just cause. And as you all know, there are other conditions that have to be satisfied in order for resort to force uh, to be uh, permissible. But I do uh, want to just make a few remarks about, kind of, well, what do we do with this? What, what could we do with this today? Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, it's unlikely that these moral arguments are going to warrant uh, reform to international law at present. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is because of the institutional context in which international law um, operates. Right? These are claims of justice um, that cannot be, I think, effectively um, advanced uh, under the existing international legal order. Uh, also, I don't think we're likely to see any of these moral arguments cropping up uh, in front of the ICJ or an international diplomacy or international tribunal um, governing the uh, law of the sea. Right? So from the kind of top-down perspective, right, can we um, give these moral theories to those who exercise political power in international affairs and then they will implement them? I don't think we should expect to see that, uh, nor should we see that uh, anytime soon. On the other hand, <laughs> it's possible that these moral theories will have an effect, so to speak, from the ground up. Right? So that law and power, political power, will not leave the people, but in fact will eventually come to reflect changing views of the people. So it's possible that these moral theories may shape our attitudes toward uh, secession. It's possible that these moral theories are moving in step, say, with views about secession that we're seeing in Europe, for example. Uh, it's also possible that these moral theories might help us reconceive of sovereignty. What is the content of the rights that states exercise over territory? Can that kind of control over territory be shared amongst different jurisdictions? Um, on the other hand, it's also possible that these theories will be used rightly or wrongly. That is, 
accurately reflecting the theorist's intentions or not in order to mobilize uh, future wars over territory. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> these tables, since this was a, a rush job and probably a new topic to you, I've put on the table some handouts in there. The last page of the handout does have a short uh, suggested reading list, so if it's a topic of interest, um, that may be of use to you. Okay.